who was John Bell? What was the Bell experiment? Bell's theorem, Bell's inequality. And I think it's worth stating again, what were the implications that it had on quantum mechanics? Right. So Bell was a physicist. He was Irish. He grew up uh, in, I guess, kind of lower class, middle lower class circumstances where I, I think it was unusual to even go to college. Um, he became a, a physicist, got a very good education. And the main thing was about him, though, was not his education. Of course, lots of people got good educations, but just, again, his insistence on trying to understand things, um, of not being satisfied with just being told, this is how it is and don't ask. Or, um, And so Bell had the same experience that everyone does when he was first taught quantum mechanics is he didn't understand what was going on, which isn't to say he didn't understand the mathematics and he couldn't do the problem sets and you know, do well in it. That's a different matter. There's, there's a little, there's a, I mean, I call it the quantum recipe. There's an algorithm for using this to make predictions. Anybody with a little bit of mathematical facility can do that. But if you ask, yeah, but what's going on in the physical world? What, 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 what are you telling me about the physical world with this? As I say, a standard quantum text will not even attempt to answer that question, and it will, a standard physics teacher will try to dissuade you from asking it. And Bell thought the way anybody would normally think, as I say. So go back to the example that Einstein worried about. I have a piece of, and this will connect up to Schrodinger, I have a radioactive atom sitting in the center of this spherical detector. Quantum mechanically, what's happening, in, 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 well, let's not worry about quantum mechanics. If I do this many times, what do I find? I find that, well, if I wait, eventually a spot appears. Um, it will appear in different locations and not preferentially anywhere on the sphere, and it'll appear at different times, right? So sometimes I have to wait a long time, sometimes a short time. I have statistics about that, about how often these spots appear, but they appear spatially in no preferred direction. Quantum mechanics says, well, you've got this wave function, this quantum state for, for your radioactive atom, and all the time it's, as it were, leaking out um, in a perfectly spherical, symmetric way in all directions. It's kind of, it's kind of just leaking out. And if you want to know the likelihood at any given moment that a spot will appear somewhere on this sphere, you take the amount of quantum state there is there at that moment and square it, and yeah. you get a number, and that number will say, this is how likely. Yeah. Okay? That's how it works. Mm -hmm. And then you say, yeah, but what's going on? But, but wait, wh why does the spot, okay, that, <laughs> why does the spot appear here? Now, the natural thought is, well, there's some interior piece, uh, 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 an alpha particle or, you know, uh, uh, some neutrons, electrons, whatever, in this, say, uranium atom that's kicking around in there. I mean, now very democracy in picture, somehow vibrating or kicking around or moving around. And eventually it kind of works its way out and shoots off in some direction. Now, maybe uh, it could come out in all kinds of different directions and maybe it could come out in different times depending upon how it bounces around. Uh, but that's really what's going on, and that gives rise to this distribution of spots, both over space and over time. But that would be a hidden variables theory, because it's postulating there's something that's not described by the quantum state, namely the actual location and motion of this little thing that shoots out. So anybody who looks at this is going to say, well, tell me about that. And this is where Bohr will say, no, there's no story like that. You can't think that way. And, and Bell's immediate result as any right th thinking person would be is, well, why can't I think that way? You know, yeah. It seems like a good way to think. It seems like the obvious explanation. And then he was told, he says, he was told, well, von Neumann, the mathematician von Neumann has proven that no such hidden variables theory can work. That is, no hidden variables theory can reproduce the predictions of quantum theory. It's impossible. It's mathematically impossible. And Bell said, well, he was shocked, right? He was surprised. And he just put it out of his mind. Why? Well, because von Neumann's book had 
not been translated from German into English, and he didn't read German, so there's nothing else he could do. And he was told by this expert, right, his professor, von Neumann, you know, person who ought to know, von Neumann has told, you know, has 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 a proof. So stop trying to think that way because he's proven it can't be done. And then uh, in 1952, David Bohm publishes a, a paper in Physics Journal called "Hidden Quantum Mechanics in Terms of Hidden Variables." part one and part two. And it is exactly what it says it is. It's an account of quantum mechanical phenomena that does postulate additional variables. He called them hidden, but anyway, additional variables. And Bell read that and he read it carefully and he said, yeah, this works. I mean, what, what Bohm has written here does in fact reproduce all of those predictions. It would predict that you would get these spots um, with this distribution. And it's done in terms of these additional variables. Hey, what's going on, right? My professor told me that von Neumann had proven that you can't do this. And I have in front of me a flat counter example. Here it is done. And at that point, he could get von Neumann and he gets the book, he looks at it, and he immediately spots an assumption. It's not that von Neumann made a mathematical error, but he makes an assumption in his proof. And he said, Bell later says, the assumption was foolish. It was foolish is the word he used. Not a reasonable physical assumption. There's another interesting story, which is that somebody goes, I think in the 40s, I'm not sure, to Einstein when he's in Princeton. And Einstein's been thinking also in terms of these additional variables all this time. And the, the interviewer, I can't remember who it was, says, yeah, but what about von Neumann? And tells a story that, that, that Einstein goes to his bookshelf, pulls von Neumann's book off the shelf, opens it to a page, points to something and says, there's no reason to believe this. And it's the same thing that Bell, as soon as you're thinking this way, as soon as, you know, you, you, you cast a critical eye on what von Neumann did, it's not hard to see that there's an assumption which has no real justification. And many people saw that, but it was suppressed. It was much easier to tell your students, um, von Neumann settled this, stop think, trying to think this way. What was the assumption? I'm sorry. That, so the, the, the technical assumption, the mathematical assumption, I'll try to describe it. In quantum theory, as I say, they talk about observables. Um, that's the thing Bell didn't like. He said, well, talk about beables. Talk about what there is, not what you can observe. But these observables in quantum theory are associated mathematically with things called Hermitian operators. So these are just well-defined pieces of mathematics. So you say, position, that's an observable. What's the operator? Here it is. Momentum, that's an observable. What's the operator here? These operators have mathematical relations between them. So one can be the sum or the difference of others. You know, they're well-defined mathematical relations between the operators. Von Neumann's assumption was that if you postulated these additional variables that were accounting for the results of, say, a position experiment or a momentum experiment, right? Why did the why did the the spot form exactly here. So I postulate some actual object that was, was there. He assumed in his proof that, that the, these additional variables, their values would have to be mathematically related to each other in exactly the same way as these, these operators are mathematically related to each other. And there's no reason to assume that. I mean, Bohm didn't assume it. And Bell, on thinking about it, said, why would you think that? Why, why would you put that constraint on an additional variables theory, a hidden variables theory? It's not a reason. Physically, it's not a reasonable constraint. And Bell even gives a little short argument that says, it's immediately obvious if you put that constraint on, of course it can't be done. You don't even have to go through much thought just to explain things about uh, angular momentum. Um, so he said, yeah, that's, that's, that, that, that's foolish. Um, yes, I understand I can't build a theory with that particular mathematical constraint on it, but but I see no reason to put that constraint on it. And if you take that off, you can do it. And here, Bohm has done it. And long before Bohm really, Louis de Broglie did it, I mean, 
back in the 20s. So it's not even very hard to find a theory that works that way. But people convinced themselves because they didn't, again, I, it, the only explanation for this in my mind was that they were very, a bunch of physicists were very, very psychologically motivated for there not to be such a theory. They didn't want there to be such a theory. And if, and von Neumann had given them a kind of uh, straw to grab onto and say, look, it can't be done. You know, you're just wasting your time. Get with the program, right? Yeah. 